Um, well, thanks for having me. I'm Steve Donnelly, um, conventionally trained pediatrician. Uh, went to the University of New England for medical school, did my pediatric residency at, at Maine Medical Center. Closer. At Maine Medical Center. <laughs> and um, 2009 to 2011, I did a two-year fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona. Um, so the question is, what is integrative medicine? Anyone know? Want me to tell you? Yeah. All right, so the short answer is that it's a blend of conventional medicine with everything else. Uh, well, what is everything else? There's a lot of focus on nutrition, um, herbs and supplements where appropriate, uh, manual medicines like osteopathy, uh, physical therapy, massage, chiropractic, that sort of thing. Um, what we call whole system medicines, uh, traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture, um, Ayurvedic medicine, which would be from the Middle East, um, homeopathy, naturopathy, things like uh, mind-body medicine, energy medicine, like, like healing touch, Reiki, um, spirituality. I'm probably forgetting something, but you get the idea. It kind of is all that other stuff, okay? Um, anyone, we, we don't use every modality for every patient. It's, it's you know, patient dependent. There has to be buy-in as well. If spirituality is not your gig, we're not going to shove it down your throat. Um, but um, it, 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 it blends it all, all that other stuff with conventional medicine. Um, ever heard, anyone here heard of Andrew Weil? Yeah. All right, we got some hands there. He's sort of the guru of integrative medicine. Um, conventionally trained physician, He's tra he trained at Harvard, went to medical school at Harvard. Um, but over the years, just became a little frustrated at times with how, how narrowly focused conventional medicine can be at times. And you know, this is in no way poo-pooing conventional medicine at all. Um, much, much good has come out of conventional medicine. But the idea is, you know, and I don't know what he stumbled across first, but for example, um, acupuncture works very, very well for migraine headaches. And you know, he stumbled across that. And he's like, geez, why aren't we at least offering this or discussing this as a potential therapy, you know, instead of always going to the prescription? Um, ginger works very good for morning sickness during pregnancy and nausea during like the stomach flu. That's where sipping ginger ale comes from. Uh, the issue is these days there's no real ginger in ginger ale, so it doesn't work. Um, but you know maybe that's a little safer for the fetus during pregnancy, and you know especially with this stuff out now about you know Zofran and, and stuff being used during pregnancy and potential birth effects. Um, so the point is, why aren't we offering this as as a as a another possibility, another modality. And anyway, the more and more he stumbled across, the more and more he found validity in, in these things. And he ended up creating a team of experts in all those modalities and set up a program at the University of Arizona, a uh, two-year fellowship program where providers like myself can go out and learn about these things. So um, I did that from 2009 to 2011, and uh, fascinating program. And you know, I blended in with my conventional um, medicine. So, you know, how, what, you know, as it, as it pertains to CF, um, you know, one of the things I always, I always start out with everybody um, is nutrition. And one point I try to emphasize with everyone who sees me is that food is medicine. Everything we ingest, whether it be broccoli, candy, sugar, Tylenol, cocaine, has a physiologic effect on us. And um, we lose sight of that. I think we all know it intuitively, but we lose sight of that at times. And it's just quicker to drive through here or just whip this together or open this little pack. But when it comes down to it, what we put in is what makes our body work. It's the building blocks of everything that we use to, to grow and function. Um, so I really do a lot of emphasis on nutrition. And I'm going to sort of get off a little bit, and, and but there's a method to my madness, so, so bear with me. And everyone who comes to see me hears this uh, little piece. <laughs> um, so if you think about what ails us right now as a society, um, heart disease, cancer, number one, number two. So again, it sounds like I'm way off base here, but there is a method um, to my madness. When I was in school, those were two separate areas of um, study, cardiology, um, oncology, and not felt to be linked by any one particular thing. Another big area on the rise, um, neurodegenerative diseases like uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. 
Okay, again, separate area of study, neurology, not felt to be linked to those prior, previous two. Another big area, uh, autism, uh, depression, anxiety, ADHD, those things are skyrocketing, okay? Again, not felt to be related to those previous things. Well, what you're gathering is that there is a link, okay? And there is, but we can throw into that link um, asthma, okay? Um, which with CF is a big thing, okay? Um, arthritis, um, autoimmune diseases like diabetes and, and thyroid, um, eczema, allergies, inflammatory bowel, irritable bowel. You can go on and on. The common thread with all of those illnesses is inflammation, okay? Inflammation around the arteries, they heart disease. Cancer has its roots in inflammation. Um, there's a, a cytokine theory of depression. Cytokines are inflammatory mediators, okay? So, all, and we know that inflammation in the lungs is the main driver in asthma, okay? So where is all this inflammation coming from? A big, big smoking gun is what we're eating and or not eating, okay? And if you look around the world where traditional diets, traditional cultures, where their diets were highly plant-based, lots of vegetables, fruits, healthy grains, also lots of fish, um, some beef, poultry, pork maybe, um, but very little to no processed foods. You did not see anywhere near the rates of any of those categories of illnesses like you do here in the West, okay? So it does kind of make you think, okay, is it something that we're eating? Um, now that we're exporting our Western diet, standard American diet all over the world, skyrocketing, all those things, okay? So again, raises that red flag, is it something we're eating or not eating? Um, more and more evidence is coming out supporting that. What is it about our standard American diet that's pro-inflammatory? And so, again, with asthma being a big component, lung stuff in the, with, with CF, we want to limit our inflammatory drives. Okay? What can we do environmentally? What can we do to try to limit, limit that exposure? Um, so what is it about the standard American diet? Um, the processing. You know, I can't look at an ingredient list on a processed food label and point to this thing 10 lines down that I can't pronounce and say this thing causes inflammation. But I also can't tell you that it doesn't. We don't know, you know, we, we just don't know. We're really being used as guinea pigs. The food lobby here is, is tremendous. To just emphasize that point, there are seven dyes and preservatives banned in the UK and European Union. They're banned over there because of documented evidence linking them to behavioral and learning issues in some people. Not everyone, but some. But they're banned. They're all throughout our food supply here. Okay, I'm not, I'm not saying that they're inflammatory. I'm just saying that our government isn't doing a good job in, 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 in keeping us from being exposed to it. Um, another big area would be you know, pesticides. Pesticides um, are neurotoxins to the pests that we're trying to keep from destroying our crops. Okay. At worst, it might be neurotoxic to us, although they'll, the proponents will say, oh, we don't have those uh, metabolic enzymes or those metabolic pathways, sorry, um, that those pests do, so it doesn't affect us. Okay, well, maybe that's true, but you know what? There's some evidence now coming out that our bacteria in our guts may have those same um, metabolic pathways, and maybe the pesticide residue on our produce is altering our mi gut microbiome, okay, the bacteria that live in our gut. And, you know, we know that the gut microbiome is involved in clearing toxins from the body. We know that the gut microbiome is helpful in developing the immune system. And if that's imbalanced by whatever reason, and you know, antibiotics and such as well, then who, what, what does that do? And that's sort of a, a new area of research that, you know, we don't know a lot about. But, but you know, we know all about these pesticides being uh, put on the foods. Don't even get me going on genetically modified foods. Um, but even breaking it down into the, the macronutrients, okay, like carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. The breakdown of carbs, fats, and proteins has shifted tremendously over the last 40 or 50 years to be very high, high, high in carbohydrates, and on top of that, very high in sugar, okay? And that has an effect, okay? Part of that problem is our, it's our own doing because back in the 70s we were linking cholesterol with heart disease, okay? And so, well, cholesterol comes from fat, therefore we shouldn't eat fat and low fat, low fat, low fat. Well, you take the fat out of foods, you gotta replace it with things like to make it taste better like sugar and carbs. And so that's, again, a part of our own doing. The irony of it is that 
the cholesterol is not the issue with heart disease. It's the body's inappropriate response, or uh, the body's response to what? Inflammation. Okay, the body's depositing cholesterol down there trying to heal inflammation. So it all comes back to inflammation. So maybe we created our own problem. But what happens if you eat a carb load and there's no fat, protein, fiber in that mix? If it's just straight carbs. And carbs are gonna be your, your breads, your pastas, your cereals, your crackers, your juices, your candy, stuff like that. All carbs are converted to sugar. Carbs go in, blood sugar spikes. At the peak of blood sugar, inflammation is created. There's reactions called advanced glycemic end products. And these are reactions between sugar and proteins throughout the body. And this is sort of where the genetics comes in. If your genetics is to heart disease, maybe that inflammation contributes to the inflammation around the arteries of your heart. If it's to asthma, lungs on fire, okay? Um, you know, it's not 100% the driver, but it, it can be contributing to it. So um, there's an interesting theory out there looking at diabetes as a model for advanced aging, okay? Um, diabetics as a population get depression far greater than the general public and they get it young. They get heart disease far greater than the general public and they get it young. Um, they get cataracts, they get kidney disease, they get sensory neuropathies, they get all these things that you wouldn't expect an otherwise healthy person to get until they're really old. Their issue is what? blood sugar, right, because their pancreas isn't making insulin. So they have high blood sugar, okay? Extrapolating that out to what I was talking about, our diet being very high in carb and on top of that high in sugar, on average, the average American's blood sugar is higher than it was 40 years ago. Is that a reason for so all the rise in some of this, these things that we're seeing? And there's more and more evidence coming out to support that. Um, just to sort of throw out another little tidbit to that. Unlike a diabetic, we do have a pancreas that makes insulin. So our, our, our sugar levels on average are higher, our insulin levels in response to that are higher, and there's a whole cascade of downstream effects. That's beyond me, I'm not an endocrinologist, but there's a, there's a whole cascade of downstream effect. And is that what we don't know? Is that contributing to this? And, and again, more and more stuff supporting that. The other big pro-inflammatory drive is that we get too many omega-6 fats and not enough omega-3 fats. Omega-6 fats come from the oils of grain, corn oil, sunflower oil, cottonseed oil, soybean oil. These oils, when they're ingested, these fats, when they're ingested, become the building blocks of hormones that upregulate inflammation. Further down the line, they upregulate cell division, so that's your cancer link. Omega-3s from fish come, do the opposite. They downregulate inflammation, downregulate cell division. So where do you see these omega-6 oils, the sunflower, the cottonseed, the soy, and, and corn? any processed food ingredient list, right? Usually you see sugar and then contains one or more of the following oils, very high up on the list. Okay, so if we eat a highly processed diet, we're getting that pro-inflammatory drive, not only from the sugar and the carbs, but also from the, from the omega-6. Um, and, and most Americans don't eat enough fish, so we have this real high pro-inflammatory drive um, and nothing to offset it. Normally you want about a five to one ratio, omega-6 to omega-3. Inflammation is actually an important part of our immune response, part of our healing response. So it's an important mechanism, but we just don't want it left unchecked. So you need things in balance. So normally, again, you want about a five to one ratio, omega-6 to omega-3. The standard American diet ranges anywhere from 25 or 40 to one, pro-omega-6, pro-inflammatory. And that's, and then on top of that, the high carb stuff. So diet is a big thing I, I talk about with, with CM patients. Um, you know, calories, big thing. Um, the metabolic demands require like 120 to 150% of um, caloric intake compared to, to norms. Um, but you wanna know what kind of, you know, a calorie from a Pop-Tart is gonna be, you know what I mean, is, is, is different. You wanna put the right calories in to, you know, not just necessarily focus on calories, but focus on, okay, what can we put in to, to, to lessen that inflammatory drive and maybe help out with um, um, lung function there, okay? So I talk a big part about that. Um, there's also a high, um, uh, you know, the, the absorption in the gut of the fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, so make sure we're, you know, most of the, the aqueduct vitamins are, are, the, are the big ones taken, but I also try to make sure that they're in the diet, check levels. Um, uh, your, your antioxidants are depleted, so we kind of check those, make sure we're getting plenty of foods with antioxidants, make sure that any supplements there that can be helpful. Um, 
Beyond that, things like osteopathy can be very, very helpful um, for CF patients. I meant to ask David Keller, um, he's an osteopath, that, uh, along with Brian Beck, does a lot of work at the Barbara Bush Children's Hospital. And I seem to remember him, he and I share space in my, in my integrative office, um, and I seem to remember him telling me about a study that he was involved in where they do um, some of the manipulative techniques and they are showing improved lung function, improved ability to, ability to sort of get around the unit and stuff much quicker than if it's not done. Um, so that's you know a very important component of uh, sort of integrative medicine. Um, probiotics can also be very helpful. Um, Lactobacillus GG has, has been one that um, has been shown to um, be very helpful reducing gut inflammation and maybe even help in pulmonary function as well. Um, there's several herbs to think about. Um, you know, and then things like massage therapy um, can be very helpful in improving lymphatic flow. Um, you know, getting back to the herbal stuff, sometimes I'll focus on, okay, how can we we boost the immune response, um, you know, so these sort of viral colds don't lead into secondary in infection. How can, we, how can we sort of boost that response there too? So there's many sort of avenues that I kind of work at, but uh, I always drive home the nutrition. If you didn't guess, I'm passionate about that. <laughs> so any, I guess I'll pass it on now, all right? Um, unless anyone has some specific questions. Yeah. How would you recommend the administration of the probiotic? Um, you mean orally versus or well, um, daily, twice daily? I've heard two weeks on, two weeks off. Um, yeah, I don't think you need to take them continuously. I think two weeks on, two weeks off is reasonable, but I think daily is probably the way to go. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh, yes. Um, how can you make sure that the omega-6, omega-3s are in balance if you, like, how would you calculate that based on what you're eating versus how did, how Well, I think, you, you know, they, they do have blood tests, but they're ridiculously expensive, so I don't even bother doing them. Um, I usually just try to slowly work toward, normally I'll do an omega-3 supplement, like a fish oil supplement, okay? Um, and on top of that, I'll reduce just by reducing and working toward a less processed diet, you're gonna work your omega-6 level down just by that. And if you were to go higher on omega-3, is that ever bad with the ratio of omega-3 goes higher than the five to one? Like if you were a five to five omega-6 to omega-3? Uh, that's a good question. I don't, know if, I don't know if that's been studied. It'd be kind of hard to get there, you know, uh, unless you're just eating fish <laughs> and nothing else. But, um, yeah, I don't know if that's been studied, if they've done a higher omega-3 to omega-6 uh, ratio. Um, but yeah, it would be hard to do that dietarily. Um, so the other big you know, place where we're getting omega-6s, right, if you're eating conventional beef, cows are fed grains, right? Here's a quick funny story. First day of my fellowship, I'm out there and, and uh, you know, I, I, prior to going out, I had started some dietary changes myself. I have asthma and um, started, okay, I'm gonna cut my omega-6 load, eating more sort of whole foods, um, vegetables, fruits, grains, stuff like that. Started taking fish oil, um, also corrected my vitamin D and my asthma symptoms. I mean, I was always in well control, but I, I noticed dramatic improvements in my um, just breath. I mean, I was able to, I was able to well, for example, I'm a runner. I, I, I never need my albuterol inhaler. Um, always been well controlled, but when I started this regimen, like three months later, I remember being out running and thinking, wow, I feel like I'm in bed asleep breathing, but I'm out running six miles. But it had never been a problem before. I just didn't know how good it could be, okay? Um, so anyway, back to the dietary. I was able to drop off some of my inflammatory meds. I'm still on like a low level um, inhaled corticosteroid, but I got rid of Singulair, I got rid of uh, the mid-level um, inhaled corticosteroids, so I lowered my, my load just through, through those dietary chains. But anyway, I started saying, okay, I'm gonna eat farm-raised salmon. I don't wanna deal with the mercury and the PCBs and the ocean fish and all that stuff. So um, I go out to Arizona, first day of the fellowship. Um, Dr. Weil says, who here eats farm-raised salmon? And I proudly raised my hand, and I looked around the room, and there's only other, like three other hands up and 75 people, I'm like, oh, <laughs> and he goes, you're not getting omega-3, you're getting omega-6 because they feed farm-raised salmon, corn, and grains. I'm like, damn. No? <laughs> so they just, you get hit everywhere with it. So. 
Yes. What are your thoughts on essential oils? I think those are awesome. I, I, I that's my next big venture. Um, we did a brief introduction to them. Um, they're fascinating, and you know, there's there's a lot of research looking into them as antimicrobials um, because um, unlike say conventional antibiotics, where there might be one, maybe two mechanisms of action, the essential oils have several. So it's hard for bacteria to develop resistance when they're being hit by different mechanisms of that oil. Um, so there's a lot of research there. So I think, um, you know, things like um, uh, eucalyptus oil um, can be very helpful <clears throat> for opening the airways and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know a lot, but I, that's my sort of next interest once I find time. <laughs> Yes. I should probably make an appointment with you. Uh -huh. <laughs> but um, there are lots of organizations or companies that run the farm mega food bandwagon, and you can buy anything from Rite Aid brands or whatever. How do you know you're getting the best quality? Excellent question. The question was, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, you could actually raise this question with supplements in general, not just omega threes. Um, so when I give specific recommendations um, on products, these. Um, I use a, a third-party lab that, that tests these things to make sure that you're getting what you're getting. Um, so, for example, um, you know, Carlson fish oil is what I like, and, and you know, it's been third-party tested, and um, you get what, you're, what, you, what it says on the label. Whereas you can go down the list and look at some of these, you know, Fred's, Walmart, whatever, you know, uh, fish oil. You know, it could be WD-40 for all you know. But uh, I'm just kidding there, it's not. But, um, but, you know, they do the test to say, are you getting the ratio of DHA to EPA or EPA to DHA, which are the subcomponents of the omega-3s? Are you getting in that sample or in that, in that capsule or in that liquid what the label says? And there's a number that don't pass the test. So Carlson is one that I use a lot that typically does. Um, so anyway, when I give whatever product, um, whether it be multivitamin, whether it be vitamin D or whatever, I give specific recommendations based on that third party lab. Do you find it's um, you, you find that uh, the patients are getting sure insurance coverage easier these days? Is it really? Yeah, I, I haven't had any problems. Hey, so, um, um, you know, I, I don't know as they, I mean, the issue is, you know, they're, they're, I'm billing under a general pediatrician. Um, that's what I am. And, and, and even though there is fellowship uh, training in, in integrative medicine, the ins and there's actually a board certification in, in integrative medicine, the insurance companies haven't recognized yet so that yet, so they haven't set up like specialist categories like a pulmonologist might have or something like that. Um, but I, I haven't had any issues with insurance reimbursement. How did I do on the nutrition there? <laughs> <laughs> we got to chat sometime about nutrition. <laughs> We'd just be like, arr, arr, arr. <laughs> So, all right. So do I hand the stuff to the So in addition to um, integrative medicine, we also wanted to spend a few minutes on what works for uh, kids with CF and rising almost adults with CF. So um, I would say I invited, but I think I'm going to say I drafted. A, a few um, moms to come up here and participate and we're just gonna ask them some questions about their kids and feel free to jump in at any moment I think I'm gonna start at this end uh, Vicki's a mom of a pretty serious high school athlete who manages to be a high school athlete and do all his treatments and actually works a little bit on his nutrition and I think um, what I want to ask her is really how did you get here? How did this happen? All of us, you know, with your children with CF and your children without CF, it's hard to get there to get all that in. And how, how did, some things she can think of as a mom that got him to where he is right now. Um, 
I'm, my name is Vicki Farr, and my son is Jared. He's 16. He goes to Levitt High School. And I think to begin with, I have to thank the Mary Ellen and Dr. Karens for all that they did, because they started out when he was diagnosed at four months with telling us at 16 he needs to be independent. And he's totally independent now. He's just, he's gonna be 17 soon, and this year he's been just totally, totally independent. But as far as exercising and being an athlete, he started out um, very hyper. We would, he'd come home from school, and of course on the bus you have to be quiet. In school you have to be quiet, and he'd come home and bouncing off the wall. So before supper or during supper, he had to run around the house 10 times. Or, and he'd come in and go, can I run 10 more times? Sure. Yeah. And so he always ran. And um, starting, he did all the sports growing up, the t-ball, everything, and he picked soccer, he loved. Soccer got him into Nordic skiing. A parent saw him running in soccer and was like, we need him. So he started Nordic skiing. Absolutely loved it because it was a sport that you were on a team, but you were alone in the woods in the snow. And he loved it. He worked hard at it. And um, he also did cross country running to train for Nordic skiing. And he also does track and he's very good and but he's put a lot of work on it he into it he also um a year and a half ago two years ago he started his own bodybuilding regimen he studied online so he'd come home from his sports exercises have a bite to eat do his therapy and out to the garage zero weather there's no heat and he bodybuilds for at least 45 minutes to an hour every night and he has different things he works on to do with his muscles and all this. This past year, he got into the nutrition part and very serious, you know, all the protein, all the shakes. And he did all his studying. We just saw a doctor a week and a half ago and she asked him, well, how much protein? He broke it down to the different types of protein, everything he's eating. He knew exactly what he wants to do. And he wants to be a dietitian and personal trainer for his career and um, he's he is highly motivated he's driven to be normal and that's what the bodybuilding I believe started as he wants to be normal we've always told him you are normal but no he wants to be like everybody else he wants to be normal he wants to look normal not skinny and um, he works very hard very hard, harder than the, the normal child does have to. And I just said the normal child, but the average child. He works hard to maintain everything. And um, as a mom, I'm very proud of him. He knows the meds he's on, he knows what they're for. But he, he also has had to help take control. And I think part of it is a personality and part of it is we've pushed him to do this. And um, I guess that's all I have to say, unless somebody has a question, I guess. Yes. What's, um, two questions, what, his, what is his mutation and what's his lung function, his um, NDV1? He has the, the common, um, yeah. And then he, he has a rare, and I can't remember, it's, I thought of that earlier, I can't remember what the rare one is. But he, he has, he's had some blockages when he was younger and I think the hardest was when he was young and we didn't know how much enzyme to give him, not to give him. We'd go to family functions and it's buffet and he's eating with all the kids and you see him run by, he's got this, he's, and you're chasing him trying to find out how much he's eating. Well, I didn't have any, he had his chocolates all gone, but he didn't eat any. So it, that was harder once he figured out, and I mean, I called to see how long I could go without him having his enzymes before it would be child abuse because he wouldn't take them. I don't want them. And we kind of went through a spot we had to kind of make him take them. But once he figured out, I feel better taking my medicines, there has been no problem. For him, it was his first hospitalization, which was when he was in eighth grade. And he does not want to go back. So he avoids it at all costs. <laughs>
sounds like um, it was a combination of, of the family pressuring him to keep on top and, and maintaining, but then he seems like a special boy that he's he's got a lot of self discipline and motivation. So it's a little genetic in there for me. Yes, borderline OCD. <laughs> <laughs> He cleans my house when we're all at work. I would come home to a clean house at night. Yeah. <laughs> and he's not for rent. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Vicki. Um, so next, um, Angela is a mom of a middle school child. Another challenge, her middle school child is also active in um, the current Vertex trial and has been for a while, so we spent a lot of time with them. Um, and has some really great characteristics, I think, that keep between their relationship, mom and daughter relationship, and how things move forward has really helped. A lot of humor, I think, really helps in their lifestyle because any of us who've been um, pre-adolescent parents can tell you it's not always easy. So what, um, She's got a lot to manage. So she, you know, at the other extreme, she's been in the hospital quite a few times. She um, has a lot of things she does for her health care and manages. So we just want to ask Angela to tell us how she gets all those things done in one day. Yay. <laughs> so I'm Angela, and my daughter is Milena. She's 14, and she goes to Madonna Middle School, and we are going to be a freshman next year and she does every sport she does soccer she does she's doing softball right now she does basketball so it's kind of hard when you're in middle school you have to practice every day I mean Monday through Friday it's not like elementary school when you only have one or two days of practice so you have to make sure that you're getting her best in in the morning and she gets up around 5 at 5 30 to do that which that is, she doesn't want to do it. I mean, who wants to sit there for 20 minutes or, you know, to do her best? But we're just trying to instill in her that this is going to make you feel better. But, you know, I, I wish I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think from watching from the outside, um, she does virtually every med we prescribe. Um, she does nighttime tube feeding, so she's got a lot going on, and yet she gets it all done. She comes in with a smile. There's, there's the battles at home for the early morning like everywhere else, but I think from the outside looking in, we see a lot of how the interactions and trying to just know that it's the norm, it's going to happen, and I, I think the adding of humor that uh, you and your husband tend to do really lightens up the load of all that serious amount of work she's got to do just to maintain her day. And well, we try to remain positive too. I mean, that's the number one thing. We don't treat her like she's sick because she's, we don't think she's sick. This is the only thing that we know. We only have one child. We don't have a normal child, you know what I mean? So we just try to remain positive with her at all times. And yeah, we always are always laughing and you know, we're the loud people in clinic. <laughs> so just look for us, because I mean, we, we just, I don't know. We just like to have a good time and try to remain positive on everything. And with her doing the study and everything, I mean, I noticed a change. As soon as we knew that we were on active study drug, I mean, I swear it was like four days later where on the, she's on the basketball court and she's the first one down and she was always the last person you know because it was hard for her to breathe I just noticed a difference yeah and um, I say for last Sarah Sarah's an integral part of our uh, family advisory board very busy there and she's the mother of a, a preschooler which has its own challenges when you're thinking about really thinking about good nutrition and, and I think she has a big focus on good nutrition and has used integrative medicine and uh, seen Dr. Donnelly and done those things and how do you do that with a preschooler when you know no is a great word <coughs> what's my question <laughs> as a mom of a preschooler
preschooler, how do you get that good nutrition going? Um, a lot of bribery <laughs> in videos, um, but also a lot of what these mothers have already shared in their process of you will feel better, your tummy will feel good, we're filling up your gas tank, um, all of those great tricks of the trade. Um, I think for Mamie, who's four, we have found that um, keeping a spreadsheet and letting her be in the process of that, that we get a check for this, we get a check for that, and checking that out at the end of the day, and, and it's not just for daddy and mommy to keep track of your meds, it's for you to keep track of how you're feeling, what do you wanna share about the day, we write a little note. Um, we also, even though Mamie's only four, we work really hard to keep her extremely active. She had a trampoline before she could walk, and she bounced before she walked, and she started skiing at two, and she takes that gondola to the top of the mountain and buzzes around, and people just stop and stare. <laughs> I've been one of those people stopping and staring, I think, when she skied by me. Yeah. Um, we are going to work hard to just make her days active and full, and that starts with nutrition all the way to her um, exercising routine. So we're, we're trying to do our best too. Questions for anybody up here or thoughts from the audience? For a parent uh, participating in a trial, what, I guess, what's your, what does it involve and, and what's your typical experience? So um, when we first um, started with the trial, we came in, I, was it every, every week or yeah, couple couple weeks. I mean, it's blood draws every time we go in, and my daughter is not an easy stick. We have to have certain people that can draw her because it's it's awful. And now we, I think we have it pretty much down, don't we, Carrie? I yeah, so. I think yeah, we no, pretty much have it down. But I mean, EKGs, um, we have to do the PFTs every time we go in, and questionnaires. And I mean, every, I mean, this isn't the first study we've been on either. Um, you know, she's done several, you know, since she was little. And I mean, you never want to like have your child have any harm done to them or anything like that. So it was good with this, with this, with this drug. She was going to have to have blood draws, and we knew how bad it was going to be for her to, you know, undertake this. But she says, you know, I'm going to be helping, hopefully myself out, and I'm hopefully going to be helping other people out too. So I mean, it's just now it's easy, you know. We just have our our times. We go, what is that, every 12 weeks now, and go to Portland, and usually they're quick visits and get her height and her weight. I mean, just the average stuff that when you go to the doc, when you go to clinic, I mean, really, other than the blood draws. <laughs> but we, we're really happy that we, that she did it, or that she's doing it. Can I just make a point about that? Yep. Um, I think some people also go worried about the blood trials that, what if they end up on the placebo, so they're not on the drug that's being tested, or on the drug that you're just giving them, you know, not a real drug that but actually people have shown that even, even patients on placebo often improve in research trials because first of all, the attention that's paid to them, the attention that they're paying to their disease, coming into clinic frequently to monitoring, so if they often improve, just even when they're not on drugs. So for anyone that didn't hear Dr. Cairns is, there are other benefits from being on a trial. Um, she had said people often worry about placebo, um, my child's going to get placebo, why am I going through this and not getting the real job? But there's been studies that show that just being on the study and the extra visits and extra attention help. Many of the studies go placebo as this one did, half were placebo, or I don't know if it was exactly half, some were placebo and some had drug, and then they moved to all had drug and looked at that. So there's a lot of different ways studies are done. It's not all placebo controlled too. And another benefit being that a lot of the studies that we are testing, if they're seeing a benefit, a lot of people will get, if you're on the study, you may get rolled into actually getting the medication before it's clinically available while they're doing the testing on different doses or things like that. So um, that's often an advantage to being in the placebo.
placebo part is that you may get access to the drug quicker if they find that it's working. I, I'm, Access to the drug quicker if they find that it's working is good, but also access to having so much information about your disease, I think, as a child, and even with the adults. So being part of a research study, you're also learning a lot yourselves, both as parents and as kids, about the disease and how it works and how these new <coughs> treatments may work. For both Vicki and Angela, um, what were the favorite parts about being part of a trial and, your, and how your child felt about it and what were the worst parts? I'll let you. Um, so, uh, favorite parts as a parent with your child being in the study and worst parts? Um, I think the, the worst part was knowing there could be side effects down the road. Um, and I think the hard, another hard part was sitting your child down and explaining, yes, you're going to make money doing it, but explaining to them according to age the side effects that could happen down the road and the reality and letting them be part of the decision making was hard to, to do because you knew the money was motivating, but they also... I, I was amazed at how much he really understood and how much, like Angela said, that he wanted to be a part of it to help others as well as himself. And so he was willing to do it even if there was side effects. Can I just say I agree? No. <laughs> I will. Um, yeah, and you also, I mean, I totally agree with what you said. and. We also have a great connection with Carrie. I mean, she, I mean, Malena absolutely loves her. And I don't, I don't know. It's just the worst part. Blood draws are definitely our worst, our worst thing to deal with. But um, I mean, we are always laughing. Um, Carrie was out on maternity leave and we ended up coming for a study a study visit and Malena's doing doing her little questionnaire and I'm doing mine and Malena says I can't do my questionnaire I don't speak Spanish and I was like what are you talking about what you know cuz she's learning Spanish in school and her <laughs> her study guide was all in Spanish so she had to go hunt for a an English speaking Oh my God! It was it was the funniest thing, and we were just in there roaring. And it she's it's just I don't know. You just create a relationship with everybody, and you know there are side effects to the drugs. You know that there could be, but it's just one of those things that Melina's fourteen. She had to make the decision on her own. It's not my decision. Well, it is my decision, but I have to kind of let that stuff go you know she's got to be be her own person and she's you know very independent and yeah perfect other questions all right I'm gonna invite uh, Ted Reed and Dr. Cairns back up and we're just gonna thank everybody for coming one of the things we was thinking about the other night the very first family education day I participated in was uh, about 12 or 13 years ago upstairs from the Hannaford in our waiting room, and it was a potluck. <laughs> so Dr. Karen's myself, Russell was there, Mary Butine was there. Um, there was no, ad the adult center wasn't really happening yet, um, and um, we had, I think, about eight parents come. We did all this preparation, so I think what a change over the years, and, and now the Family Advisory Board is doing so much um, it really makes it work for everyone. So. I've just got a couple of logistical things to say. One is um, thank you very much. And what Mary Ellen was just talking about is really uh, we can attribute the ability to make it this nice to all our vendor partners who came and made this possible. So I just want to thank those who are left. And They support a lot of other family advisory boards in the United States. So, so that whole process is 
really, really welcome. Um, a couple of reminders. Um, there are purple uh, forms for feedback. We really, really would like you to just fill them out. Um, if you could uh, bring them to one of these front tables so we can find them, that would be awesome. And um, I'll just say again, if there's any interest in participating on the Family Advisory Board, consider it. I don't have to be at every meeting, but you know, some consistent uh, support would really, really be welcome. And with that, I'm gonna lay the closing remarks to uh, Dr. Carr. Okay, so um, I just, behind this. Uh, so I just had to say our family group is really on a national level recognized for how amazing they are. People really, um, I had an email the other day from um, Dr. McGoisel of the CF Foundation asking about a program that he was looking at for a pharmaceutical company to sponsor small um, events for smaller centers uh, for CF family days. And he said, I immediately thought of my medical center because I know you have such a wonderful um, family advisory group that are so strong and you're a smaller center and you were the first center that came to mind. So I think we should give the family group a big round of applause because they really, on a national level, have really made a huge difference. Um, and I also just have to say, it's just wonderful, I think, for Mary Ellen and Cindy and Jonathan <coughs> and I, who have done this for a very long time, to now see, you know, our center has gotten so much bigger, our team has expanded, you know, our physicians, our social worker, everyone, we have more than we've ever had, and I think we're just in a really terrific place in research, in quality improvement, expanding our adult center, and I think we're really going to be able to, to make our center one of the best in the country for all of you. And we really want you to contribute, to give us your input. You know, when we have all these incredible parents up here telling us every day how they make their kids do what they do, and all of you out there, it's remarkable to us. Like, we never let it go past. I'm always just blown away when I leave the room and say, how do they do it? How do they do it so well? stay so positive and produce these amazing kids that do so well. And I think the most incredible thing now, as Dr. Clancy said, is that CF care is really changing. Like, there, it's gonna be a time where we're gonna have drugs available that can really make your kids feel better. And we're gonna be able to hopefully peel away some other therapies that are very time exhaustive. And it's, I don't think there's any better time that you could be in this field and have a child with this disease. So I think to leave it on that message that there's just tremendous hope for the future for everyone. And it's just, that's why it's a wonderful field to be part of. So thank you.